Hello and welcome to my review of Lady Gaga's, I guess you would call it fourth studio album, depending on if you consider the Fame and the Fame, Fame Monster separate albums, which I do, her fourth studio album, Art Pop. It's a very divisive and dividing record for Lady Gaga fans, and I'm going back in her discography backwards in order, so it's not my favorite Lady Gaga record. Um, I like albums like Born This Way a lot more, but I want to do Art Pop before I get to Born This Way, so I've reviewed Joanne already. And you can look, I'll link it in the description box below of my review. Um, I had a lot of good things to say about that record, even though the big thing about it was that it was just so different from what we were expecting from a Lady Gaga album. And Art Pop and Joanne, you could not come up with two diametrically different albums. I mean, they're almost, it almost feels as though they're cre created by a different person. Although there are a few songs that you see the bridging through. And of course, her voice is what really unites and bridges these. She still showcases some amazing vocals on this record, even though she has a lot more vocal effects done on her voice, which is something she's used to doing up until this point. Um, and this is a very EDM synth pop record. So this album is like a love letter to electronic EDM music. She goes all out with that. She has DJ White Shadow again helping her out, Maddie on, she has Red One again. All these people come in and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but she definitely does make an album that feels at least somewhat cohesive in its sound and, you know, character, I guess you could say, because the character of Art Pop is very gaudy and pretentious. It's an album about fashion and sex and empowerment um, it's an album about, like, all of these different things, kind of some cliches, some drug stuff is in there, some darker material. It's, it's an album about, like, vices. It's an album about, like, addictions. So it's got all these things going all these different directions. And a lot of the songs have some, like, deeper subtext within them. There's a lot of metaphors. There's allegories to, like, Roman pagan gods. There's some, like, Greek stuff going on in there. All of these things to unpack, but let's start with, first of all, the album cover was designed by Jeff Koons. He made this sculpture of Lady Gaga. Now, it's pretty pretentious, and say what you want about Jeff Koons. In the fine art world, he's, well, he's love, it or, love him or hate him, for example. He does kind of raise a few eyebrows with his work. And I do expect that about him. So I am nothing against Jeff Koons. I think that what he brought to the table for Lady Gaga was unique and different. I think they're kind of a really good match for each other. They're both big egos to some extent, or at least the ego that was being presented on this album. I think through Joanne, Lady Gaga kind of realized that she's obviously so multidimensional, but she's not so, you know, look at me, look at me all the time. This album, though, it is putting herself, you know, in this tell-all position where she's just like, look at me. And it is somewhat of an artifice of herself. It, it's not Stephanie Germanata necessarily, although she does come through, especially towards the end of this album. And there are little bits and anecdotes of real life in there. I mean, this album is not just all fake or all gaudy. It's got some really heavy stuff once you unpack it. Starting with the first song, Aura, which I kind of wish was originally called Burka, because she sings, do you want to see me naked, lover? Do you want to see what's behind the aura? And then she says behind the burka later on in the song. And burka sounds a little bit more like it makes sense, you know, we're women covering up their face in Islam. However, I could tell maybe she didn't want to be really divisive with using that terminology, so she chose to call the song Aura. And Aura is a little bit more subtle. It's just talking about, like, someone's persona being, pers per, you know, maybe being a shield for who they really are. It's a little interesting because usually I kind of gauge like either the aura is fully representative of what a person is and you're sensing it, you can sense it deep down, even though they're giving you all these signals, or it is something like they constructed to make you believe and to hide who they really are. And so, you know, the album opens with her maybe putting herself in someone else's shoes, or maybe she's directly telling the, the listener or a lover you know, if you're going to be with me, do you want to see the real me? Or do you want just, you know, do you want just like fun and games? Do you want just sex? Do you want just a pretty face? Or do you want to see the girl who lives behind the aura? And it has a little bit of like a sexual thing as well, because it's like, do you want to see me at night? Do you want to see me come alive? I get those vibes a bit as well. The electronic production on this song is insane, but it's one of the songs where I think it works pretty well. 
it starts out with this very sort of um, mariachi start, which, I mean, it fits in some of the stuff she did with Born This Way. It has a little bit of a desperate, forlorn wasteland sort of feel. And then it just comes together and packs with like the most in insane electronic vocal produ production, the most insane production that she's ever put onto a track. And it is so avant-garde and so different from anything that would be seen or heard on radio. I have to give this song, in all its pretentiousness, because it is a little pretentious, I feel like it does try and it builds and it builds. And although the chorus is kind of catchy, I feel like it, and it, it does showcase her vocal range and she really sings, which is not expected. The first time you listen to it, you're like, oh God, you're just expecting like a beat drop or something, which she does do. She does abandon you know, singing throughout courses and occasions where she just lets the beat take over, which is popular in EDM music. The next track, Venus, though, is a little bit more intriguing, although personally, this song is really not a highlight for me, just because of the sound of it, especially the chorus. I remember first listening to it and just being like, it's too much is going on. There's too much sound being shoved into one MP3 file, and it's not helping. You know, we've got like some really nice sort of chimes, but then we got this pounding bass on the background and all these things coming together. It just doesn't sound that good to me. And the fact that her voice is also slightly layered and edited doesn't help it as either. So it just becomes a little bit of an assault on the ears. So it does find a footing as it goes through and you sort of find yourself singing along to it. It's not chaotic in that regard. There is a melody, there is a song structure, but it speaks to a song that's just like completely, again, like very abstract and electronic production and, you know, everything that was being thrown into the pot. There's a lot of, obviously, she's talking about Venus. She talks about a goddess of love, um, Venus portrayed as by um, Botticelli in the Birth of Venus painting. She sort of, which she references in the album art, she also sort of emulates in some of the performances of this album, of this era, with the long tussled hair and the almost nude look of the, you know, goddess of love, that prone sort of epitome of feminine beauty um, that she sort of, I don't know, she maybe makes fun of or she also just chooses to embody as a vehicle to send her message. It comes across in both ways. This album, the first half, is very loaded to talking about sex. The next song, G-U-Y, could be construed as being like literally like, I want to be the girl under you, which is what the acronym stands for. I want to be that G-U-Y. Um, it's hiding itself in this very clever acronym, but it's basically saying, I want to be underneath you right now. Um, it's got, I must admit, though, some of the most born this way, sort of pounding dark. You could tell a little bit of Zed in there because Zed is also collaborated in this song. So you hear Zed, and of course she even screams 9Z, um, which is interesting because Zed is not German, he's French. So I don't know why she's speaking in German to him, but you know, anyway, it doesn't have to make sense. Um, but she just sort of lets loose. And a lot of these songs have this sort of heavy metal aspect to them. Um, even though, of course, they're electronic, it's electronic synth pop. It's like heavy electronic synth pop. I mean, she yells, she like growls, she just like vocally, if you stripped back all the other stuff that's going on, she's really singing. It's just hard to tell that sometimes because you forget that her voice kind of turns into the electronics in the background. But GUI is catchy. I, I think as a signal, single, it's, it's fun. It's got a really great groove to it. It's pounding. It's got a great bass line. Sex Dreams with three X's, which I always roll my eyes when I have to say, is one of those songs that's just like, oh my God. I mean, I get the sort of gaudy sort of femme, femme fatale fetish that it has that's just sort of like, it's, it's reminiscent of stuff that she did in the fame. So coming off from where Lady Gaga has been, this, this song doesn't feel left field. Going now to Joanne, it's like, what the heck? But Sex Dreams, it's hard to take that song much more seriously than just someone talking about literally wanting to have sex with someone. And I mean, that's fine. You know, she talks about last night I was thinking about you obviously touching herself, which I guess Dancing in Circles does go in that direction. So those two songs are like kind of sister songs. But, you know... That's the one song on Joanne that doesn't really fit Dancing in Circles. Not that it's a bad thing. So Dancing in Circles would fit into the vein of this, these kinds of songs. Also, I Like It Rough. You know, other songs from the fame era. It, it, fits, it fits into this groove. And so it has some like really kind of, I don't know, for me, it's just like the, the 
beat to it is a little bit obnoxious. And I hate to say that about a Lady Gaga song because I was really looking forward to it. But when it builds and it just sort of has like just all of this synth work going on, it just becomes so overwhelming and loud. But again, maybe I'm just not that big into electronica or EDM. I am to an extent, but sometimes when it just feels like it's overdone, it can be a little wearisome. So this song and the next song are my two least favorite songs on this album by a long shot. Jewels and Drugs featuring not just T.I., but Twista and Too Short, three different uh, rappers that she got featured. And of course, Lady Gaga featuring a rapper is not anything new or doing and in, delving into sort of more hip-hop territory. She did that a lot with the fame. This song feels like it could belong in there, but she brings in these rappers who, I mean, Twista can rap really fast and it's a little impressive, but beyond that, you can't really understand what he's saying. It's just like, again, too much going on, too many features. I never really necessarily like when there's just like so many features on one song and then it feels like what's the point of this I get that she wants to be avant-garde and she wants to be edgy and the song feels very edgy the song feels very sexy and it's, it feels bad like it knows it's so bad it's so good you know but to me it's not good it's just bad so that's that's where it falls short for me and you know even the concept behind it it's sort of just you know we know how to make that money slap honey on a young pancake like there's there's so much that, you know, is a reminiscent of a culture that I can see her dabbling in all the time, but I don't necessarily find it appealing when she does it. It comes off a little forced or cheesy. And this song feels very forced. Like, oh, I have to put in a super hip hop song because I got all this EDM stuff going on. So, you know, and this song isn't even, the rapping is hip hop, but the rest of it is still very EDM. You don't usually hear rap with like dubstep beats in the background. It's not usually common. Usually you get like the dance hall sort of tropical sounds where you get like the minimal sort of synth, uh, R&B synth sounds. But these are like, you know, this is like rapping over dubstep, which is a little bit disconcerting or it's like, I don't know, it's just too much. And it just comes off at the end like just super pretentious. But slowly we start to redeem ourselves with manicure or mancure cleverly with the I in lowercase. The can claps get a little cheesy and I feel like this song could have benefited from stripping back the production a little bit more and just letting her like sing without so much else going on because it has a really good hook and it has a really great concept around the song and of manicure and mancure. You know, it, it's, it's an interesting idea, but I feel like it just kind of, again, like it's overwhelmingly loud. And so for me, it doesn't have a lot of repay value. But the next song, Do What You Want, featuring R. Kelly, We'll lament that for a minute, but Do What You Want is a pop song that really like freshens the ears when you listen to it. It's like, thank you. Instead of having these heavy bass pounding electronic things, riffs going on in the background, she has like just this sort of really nice synth going on in the background that just feels a lot lighter and a little bit more of a breath of fresh air from the sounds of the rest of the record. There's a bass to this, but the bass does not overpower you. Instead, it feels layered and it feels full of sound. So her voice also gets to shine a lot more and you can hear beyond the layering of her voice, her actual like high notes being held. You can hear the tonality in her voice better. You can hear that it's a human being singing and not a robot, which you hear in a lot of these songs in isolated parts, but you know. So Do What You Want is a really well -prop crafted pop song, a la The Fame, a la The Fame Monster. It fits in with all of those songs. It sounds a little bit like So Happy I Could Die in some of the synth aspects of it. The, the, the fact that it features R. Kelly though, I mean the message of the song is actually meant to be very feminist. Instead of saying Do What You Want With My Body as in like just ravage me, which can come off unfortunately because of the R. Kelly feature as very kind of not very empowering or not very feminist. And unfortunately, this, remember, was recorded in 2013. R. Kelly has since, although he's had a lot of scandals in the past, come out to have a real history of abusing women. And it's really unfortunate, and I'm sure Lady Gaga feels this way, that R. Kelly was the rapper featured. He sounds okay on this song. It's, he's like, he's sort of just like flowing nicely. He's not like overpowering like the, the previous rappers were just like trying to do so much in a short space of time. But... I really wish the version she had done with Christina Aguilera had actually made the real cut because when she did the Christina Aguilera version, it felt so much more female empowerment because she's basically saying, say what you want about me, write what you want in my papers. She wrote this song because she felt she was being body shamed for being too fat. People were tearing her apart about gaining some weight. 
And so she basically was like, I don't care. This is going to break my spirits. Write what you want. I don't care. My body is my body. My soul is another thing. And you can't touch that. But the message of the song does get a little bit construed with the sex innuendos that are implied. But it's it's still, for me, whenever I listen to it, I'm imagining what the intention of the song was, was for her to just say, basically, come at me. I'm not going to back down. I'm, I'm going to still be a pop star. I'm not going to let anything I read in the tabloids get me down or bother me. And so for that, it's sort of an anthem song. And also, again, it's just an amazing pop song. It really, it really is fun to listen to. And it's one of the songs that I replay the most on this record. Then we come to Art Pop, which is the title song on this record. Another highlight for me. This song feels very Madonna in its sound and it's like sort of talking, singing style, which also is similar to things that she did in the fame. And it feels a lot more dancey. It's got some disco throwbacks to it, and I love that about it. The sound of it is just so funky and groovy, and it just makes you want to dance. So I, for one, love this song. I love the fact that she's sort of embracing this high, you know, this gaudy sort of pretentious character and talking about how art and pop can be molded together. And of course, the theme of this album comes around the idea of pop art, which was made popular by artists like Andy Warhol. So she's flipping it around and saying this is art pop. So she's talking about pop music being, you know, fine art in a way, but in not just being fine art, but in being galvanizing or in being, you know, something that will shock and awe. And she's sort of playing to all the things that she did because her career could be summarized as being art pop. And so I think this works very well for her in the, her general catalog. Again, a highlight song for me. The next song, Swine, is definitely the most EDM-sounding song on this record. She actually lets the song literally drop to just dubstep beats, which I'm okay with. It builds up so much, like literally. I don't like songs that generally do that kind of stuff. I'm just not big into dubstep. This sound was a little bit more popular, though, back around at its time when it was released, so I see where she wanted to experiment with it. And again, she has those heavy metal screams of Swine, the message behind this song, though, is really feminist, really empowering, basically, you know, it's saying, like, men are not going to, you know, touch me, they're not going to do things to me, I don't want them to. She's been treated badly in the past by formal record executives, all these things, so she's referencing that, and, you know, she's saying, I love to watch your ass go wiggle. You know, she's just alluding to these men as being pigs, but it's not just men, she's alluding to people who are just deceitful and wrong and, you know, don't treat people fairly. She's saying, well, you wear the pig mask and that's all you're going to ever be. I'm going to out you as pigs too. So you're a literal swine. But the juxtaposition of just having this such hard song, I mean, the message is hard. So that's why the song is hard. But for me, it's just sort of like, ah, EDM, it just doesn't really do that much for her when it's this obviously EDM. But for me, I mean, you know, it's a matter of opinion and taste. Then we come to a song like Donatella, which is a parody of itself. This song is not taking itself very seriously, although at the first half you might think it is. She's literally talking about how maybe in her own insecurity, she's always wanted to be that blonde, skinny girl walking the runway. And she's talking about like, well, you know, you're going to be starving yourself and you're going to, you know, be embodying this stereotype of women that is not actually doing much for feminism. Whereas, you know, it's fine to be into the fashion world, but you have to understand that there are, there are shortcomings, especially when it comes to body image. And, you know, she's been scrutinized a lot by that. You know, she, she, can, she considers herself a part of the fashion world because she wears so much designer clothing, but she rebels against the fact that she has to be like a size zero to walk these runways. I mean, she doesn't feel like she's a model in that regard. And so this song is sort of her rebelling against it, but it's also a love letter to fashion. It's sort of like a gay anthem to, you know, people who admire Donatella Versace. I mean, she's an amazing designer and the song is obviously a tribute to her with the namesake, but it does have that camp to it, which is fun and chic. And she's sort of like giving it to her fans because she knows her fans can be like really into fashion and sometimes are needed a little bit of a a way to cheekily like laugh at something but again it's not a favorite song of mine i thought it would be more i thought it would sound more like the fame but for me it gets too the beats get too a little intense and overwhelming and the electronics are just all over the place on this song and i'm not that crazy about that sound i wish it was a little bit more subdued i wish it was a little bit more like dance house based 
like some of the other songs go instead of being like EDM based. Then we have Fashion, which is the sister song to Donatella, but this song is promoting just wearing whatever you want. It's like the artifice of creating the outfit around you. It's an extension of your soul and of your creative freedom. So she sings about just how freeing it is to wear all these designers and to feel the best at the, the bell of the ball and throw these parties. And it's, it's an ode to like this New York sort of penthouse lifestyle that, you know, a lot of Gaga fans are a part of, and she's been a part of that. I mean, she grew up in New York. So this song to me will always make me think of New York and it will always make me think of drag queens and it will always make me think of Hope Couture. And that's what it's meant to do. It also feels like, again, like another song. Fashion of His Love was a tribute to Alexander McQueen when he passed away um, on board in this way. But this song just feels like another ode to him. And she's probably going to always want to write songs to Alexander McQueen because rest in peace. And I love the piano intro. I kind of, I love the groove of this song because it, it has a 70s feel. So it feels just like retro and it feels fun. And it's such a relief from, again, the hard EDM sounds on this record. Then we come to Mary Jane Holland. This is where the album takes a darker turn and a little bit more of a metaphorical turn. But she has talked about weed use and drug use in the past. She's using all these metaphors for Mary Jane Holland. She, you know, Mary Jane being marijuana, Holland being ne the Netherlands, Amsterdam, where it's known for drug use to be like prolific. So she says, even at the beginning, meet me in the dam. And I love the fact that it ends with this lighting of the match because this song is all over the place. It is insane production. The production on this song, I think it was Maddie on who worked on this song. I can't remember. It's just insane. I don't know what else to say, but it really packs a punch. I mean, that's all I have to say. It like floored me when I first listened to it. It's not my favorite song, but the message is, it's, you know, it's there. You just have to unpack it a little bit. Um, it, when she's singing about her vices and her things, she's talking about how she wants to be more powerful than this. She wants to overcome her sins. And she's still saying, well, no, I'm not perfect. But the next song is like the crash and burn after the high. Because then we have Dope, which is just this beautiful raw power ballad with the most strongest vocal performance that she has ever, ever done on a live recording, I think. I think the lyrics are, I mean, when she sings about mining herself like coal, that lyric really dug to me because she's just literally talking about like how she was killing herself and now, you know, lurking for things, looking for fame, looking for satisfaction from drugs, from things that weren't real or weren't something that was actually en enhancing her. And then she found someone and she was like, I need you. I really need you in my life. You need to help me. I need you more than dope. And it means a lot when anyone is an addict or anyone who's dealt with this says that, you know, it's coming from somewhere really deep within. And it's them saying like, I need you to help me. It's a cry for help, but it's also a sign I'm getting better. I'm overcoming this. I'm, I'm learning so much now. Highlight song on this record. Whenever Gaga's just at the piano, she soars. And so this song is signaling more towards the sort of music that she would do on Joanne. Then we have Gypsy, which is another love letter to the fans, but it's also a reflection of her life as a pop star for the first six years or so of her career, where she's singing about going on tour, how she doesn't have a home. She literally feels homeless. She just lives in hotels and lives in a trailer, and she names drops all of these places in the world that she's visited and how she feels connected to everyone through that. And so it has, again, some Madonna sort of aspects to it in that she's talking about herself being this gypsy woman singing on the tour bus, you know, just like uniting everyone through pop music, which, you know, it's a, it's not paying homage to that. And that's fine. And it's a really fun pop song. And like I said, it's just more traditional pop in house. It's not so much EDM focused. It's, it's more just synth pop territory. And I can listen to that a lot more. Um, it, it, you know, I don't necessarily like the I, 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 I'm a gypsy, 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 I part because it feels really rushed and it sounds a little bit the rest of the, you know, chorus is so much of a belted, like, range and tonality. And that part's just sort of, like, stunted in that, in that department tone. But that's okay. You know, it, it's one little thing I pick apart. And then we close the album with Applause, which, of course, was the first single released from this album. It's one of the more artistic but still very pop songs that she's ever made. It's a favorite of mine. I love the just sort of fun sound of it where she's sort of playing the sort of Madonna-like sounding choruses. 
and she's mixing it with that edgy electronic sort of synth pop vibe. I mean, again, it has a little bit of that sound and the synth from the Fame era. So this was a big step back to what she was originally doing after Born This Way. It has that wit, you know, and charm. I stand here waiting for you to bang the gong, to smash the critics saying, is it right or is it wrong? If only fame had an IV, baby could I bear. Being away from you, I found the vein, put it in here. I mean, the lyrics are just so, you know, she references Jeff Koons. She talks about how she's, she lives for the show and she lives for this production and this aura that she can put on herself, this aura of Lady Gaga. It can be a lot of work and it's, it's tied to herself, but you know, it implies that there is something once the show curtains close that we see in Joanne, which is her sort of off the stage, applause sort of signals that I was putting on a show. You know, I was dressing up in characters and these characters help me express myself and they help me express my ideas, but they're not necessarily all that I am. I have more to me than this thing you saw, but clap for me because I just performed for you. I just released this album of 15 songs that was very garish in some parts, but it was very performative and it was very artistic. And so for that, that's what this album is about. It's about experimentation. It's about, it's about art. It's commenting on that. It's about what pop music means in the art world and in culture. And it's talking about, you know, also how the role women play in the art world and sexuality and liberating that and understanding that. And also it touches on some of the darker things beneath the surface. So it's a solid album, but it's by no means my favorite of hers. Unfortunately, out of all the albums she's released, it is my least favorite so far. I don't know if she's ever going to release a part two, which was possibly talked about when it was first released. Personally, I think it's fine as it is. I do appreciate, though, the, the energy of this album. It has so much color and energy, and it does have a lot of life. And it does have some really good catchy songs on it, which I do appreciate. She definitely has an ear for that. And maybe I do lament that Joanne doesn't have that, but I also appreciate the heart and soul of that record that feels so much more raw and personal. So art pop, it's made a statement, but you know, it's, it's not known as her best album. And I think most Lady Gaga fans will agree with that. She doesn't perform new songs as much as she does other album songs, but I'm still, you know, I still feel like it belongs in the understanding of all the different aspects of her personality and character. So that's my review. I hope you enjoyed it. I will again let you know what you think in the comments and the Joanne review is in the, uh, the description so you can watch that and I plan on reviewing Born This Way, The Fame Monster, and The Fame in that order so I will be going through those. So thanks for watching. I hope you have a wonderful day.